Joffrey, Renly, Rob Stark, they're all thieves. They'll bend the knee or I'll destroy them. The onset of winter fever had slowed but not stopped the plans the King's Council had set in motion. Greyhold would get its city. Brandon stood in the freshly built harbour of Wolfsboro. A small fleet of ships had arrived which carried the sword and stars of House Blue. The Lord Hand had sent his son and heir Colmer north to help oversee the city's development and to offer security on the border in case unrest rose. Brandon was grateful for the help. Owen had been helping him oversee the city's construction until Violet caught the winter fever as well. Owen was beside himself with worry and refused to leave her side, at risk to his own health. His good daughter's alignment had struck her hard, the poor girl had still yet to adjust to the harsher climates of the Grey Cliffs. Ambrose had sent up his personal physician to help with the princess's treatment. With his son indisposed, he had to work with John Whitetree. The Northman had come up from Sevensport. He claimed to have come from the Hornwood, where he presented himself to Ham. But something wasn't quite right about Whitetree. His arrival had brought on strange dreams. They started out the same, a white weed growing in the middle of the central square in Sevensport. Then each dream would divert. In his first dream of the weed, he left it alone. It grew until its roots went wild and engulfed the city in foliage. In his next dream, he uprooted it. All the Northmen in the square dropped dead. And in the dream he had last night, he cultivated the weed and it grew into a strong weirwood where Northmen and Andals alike danced around it. From experience alone, Brandon knew these were green dreams. It was simply a matter of figuring out what the bloody things meant. They seemed to take pleasure in their vagueness, and why had they started when John arrived? He was eager to help Brandon in any way possible. If he was being honest, John was too eager to help. Footsteps echoed on the dock and Brandon was drawn from his thoughts. Colmore Bloom had arrived. Lord Bloom, Brandon called, it is good that you've come. With this blasted fever, we need all the assistance the King can manage. The boy bowed with a smile and said, It is an honour to be of help, Lord Greystark. The King and my Lord Father do me a great honour in choosing me to help you. Brandon waved him off. Oh, enough with the formalities, boy. You're not in court. Call me Brandon. Of course, Lord, er, uh, Brandon. Come, there is much to do. The harbour, as you can see, has been completed, but there are many more houses, stores and granaries yet to be completed. We also need to start work on a refuge for the sick to be treated. That's quite the workload, Colmore quipped. Aye, Brandon nodded. If we want to keep the small folk happy and fed, we'll need a city worthy of them. With luck, many of them will pick up a trade. Who knows, perhaps we'll start working on a building up the Northern Fleet. Let's get to work then, Colmer replied. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Citadel with me, Grammy Stitch, where we're carrying on with our Knights of the North series as King Ambrose I of Andalia. In the introduction, we've seen that we are now building new city provinces up in Greyhold. As you can see here, we're building a new city, which is going to take a good few, well, no, two years. It's going to take two years to build, so that's not too bad, I suppose, but to try and improve the economy up in this area. And then we're also building a castle over in High Point to help defend and get more men in this area bordering the lands of the Stark. So... It would be nice if we could build a lot of trade zones and um, cities down the coastal provinces and have a nice economy down the coast and then maybe across the northern border and across the western border where we uh, border the Stark we can build some castles where we can get better men, uh, a bigger amounts of men should I say to attack the Starks and raise them quicker if we once again get into war with the Starks or the Wildlings or whoever else may want to invade Andalia. But yes, we do need to improve the economy. We've got a great economy anyway, but the war and the revolts have taken it out of us a little bit in the last few episodes. We really need to get that back on track. As you can see, the economy around at Sevensport is absolutely booming. I've never seen something so bad. That's probably the brightest green economy in Westeros. It actually is, other than some in Dawn and a couple around the kingdom. The Eyrie's very green and Casterly Rock, Lannisport, as you can see. But that is insanely green around Sevensport. In fact, it is actually flourishing at the moment, which is brilliant. But the northern lands are so red in our, in our lands. So we really need to change that and try and get them 
more green like our like old Andalia. But it'd be nice if we could get this eastern coast all a nice green, even if it's a lighter green, like around um, the Rose Heartlands or around Moat Kalim. That would be nice. But we definitely don't want it red. We want to at least get rid of the red if we can. So yeah, we do need to improve that economy. Religions are still looking the same. We've got all Faith of the Seven in our southern lands. It's even spread actually down into the neck now, which I did not expect to happen. And obviously our culture is Andor Northmen, which is spreading very nicely as well. Even that is replacing Kranigmen, which I didn't want to happen. I didn't want to replace Kranigmen, but it looks like it is going to happen. Seven's Port is currently got local shrines as well, which is improving our pieter, as well as large winter reserves, as we are in the middle of a mild winter at the moment. But yeah, as I was saying about our economy, I realised getting ready for this episode just how good our trade routes are now. All of this southern coastal lands are now have now got trade routes with lease. Uh, Seven's Port, Old Castle, Maiden's Gate, and the Warrior's Watch all have trade routes now uh, going to lease and the three sisters have trade ports with i think it's tyrosh isn't it the purple then we've got a nice pentoshi trade route in the bullseye and in the frosty shore which is awesome and then a nice tyrosh um trade zone in greyhold and greyhold is woodland i believe yes forest and so we're gonna get a lot of timber from there and that sort of thing in law obviously we like to try and make it feel a little bit more alive then we've got the mere trade zone above us in Skagos and the Umberlands, but that's nothing to do with it. It does slightly border Greyhole, but I don't think we don't have a dock or anything there, so it's not going to really uh, benefit us with that being there, unless we do eventually expand northward. Thankfully, um, the revolts look like they're improving. Everywhere is a nice green now, so hopefully that is the end of the revolts for now. I know we still have John Whitetree in our court who is the leader or one of the leaders of the Brotherhood. So whether we'll get something pop up later on, I don't know. But we are looking a lot better now, which thankfully is good. Hopefully we can start recovering now and making the new lands as prosperous as the old lands of Andalia. That's what we're hoping for anyway. The Lords seem to think that they have ended the Brotherhood as we learnt from the NPOV of the last episode, I think it was. But anyway, yeah, we can finally get into this. I've blabbered on about that, but I know some of you do like to know all about how those sort of things are going, the economy and all that sort of thing. It helps make this world feel even more alive in this series, which is what I love. And I know that's what a lot of you love about this series as well, just how in-depth it is. Here we go. King Ambrose now at the age of 40. So he's getting a bit old. He's got fat as well. You got fat, as Robert Baratheon said. Um, he's scarred as well from that nasty hunting accident we had a few years ago. Pretty much everything else has remained the same, though, I think, out of his traits. He's not really lost anything. Our wards at the minute are Davos Redguard and Lord Ned of the Warrior's Watch, who is our nephew. Uh, our children, our oldest daughter, Princess Violet, is obviously married now to Lord Owen Greystark. And then we've got our other three daughters, who are princesses. Um... Alice is betrothed to Lord Bolton, Princess Sansa is betrothed to Enga Firehand, and Princess Jonquil we're yet to make a match for. I'm not sure what we'll do there yet. The same with Prince Enga, he, need, he doesn't have a match either, but he has picked up a few childhood traits now, which is good. So hopefully he'll turn into something interesting. Uh, but yeah, I was going to get into the new characters. We've got two new characters for today's episode, both made by the same person as they are father and son, so it's uh, interesting, I think that's our first father and son duo to be introduced in the uh, series, so let's look for the father first before the son, and here he is, we have Roderick Snowfall, he is a Andal Northman warrior, he's a skilled commander, he's a cavalry leader and an inspiring leader, so we should be able to hopefully make use of those good commanding traits, he's attractive, a poet, He's a falconer, he's scarred, strong, a formidable fighter, he has a crow, a duelist, a hunter, honourable, just, chaste and charitable. Now we'll sort him out of marriage just to make sure that he does not die. I don't think it's really going to matter who we get for his marriage. We'll go for an old god or an andal just so it is somebody um, local. There is more of a backstory about these guys which we will find out in this or the lore video so... Don't worry about that, I will tell you more about that. His wife was of the Old Gods, which will explain some things about the sun once we meet him in a moment. Let's have a look who we've got. Who have we got? Who have we got? Who have we got? P. 
appeal. She is a Northman. Let's see if we can arrange a marriage between them. And yes, we can. So that will do. And then his son is Alitus Snowfall, who's a very different character to his father. Very different style, more of a spy master type. He has got nice long hair under that hood, but you know what they're like as soon as they have those intrigue uh, traits. They instantly wear a hood and you can't get rid of it. But he is an elusive shadow. He's attractive, he's quick, he's a homosexual, he's a poet, he's fashionable, a trained fighter, he has a pet crow, a wolf, he's a scholar, a master seducer, he's proud and patient. And now we need to find a match for him also. And as you can see, he is of the old gods instead of like his father, so he followed in his mother's footsteps, who was a old god priestess in the Hornwood. But like I said, we'll go more into their past in other episodes and in POVs and lore videos and that sort of thing. Right, so we need a wife for you let's have a look what we've got who is the best diplomat i've got an aunt oh wow she's very old best marshal very old again stewardship what about intrigue because you've got good intrigue if we can find you a match with good intrigue around your sort of age like she might do 20 oh she's a lunatic though so maybe that won't work okay i've got another peel your father married a peel though we don't want to marry you both to a peel um they're all very old with good intrigue that's the only problem what about learning any young people with good learning who are local marshal um nah. diplomacy any young diplomacy people that aren't from across the narrow sea we don't want to be marrying people from across the narrow sea if we can help it an 18 year old oh wow no she's iron born we don't want to uh we don't want to go for that what about this courtier here she's not too bad we'll go with her from river run so it's not too far away either but at least we've sorted that out now. We'll unpause so things can tick along. Oh, House Lancer, you know, the guy, Lord Roos Lancer, who's been in the series for a long time. He's getting quite old now, and he has six daughters, if you remember right there. He's had a seventh child, and guess what, guys? You're not going to believe this. It's a seventh daughter, Randa Lancer. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel sorry for that guy. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to get a male heir. But his daughter, Hostella Lancer, his oldest daughter, she is married a... Uh, matron only so hopefully he will get a male heir eventually uh to the magnificent king ambrose blessing upon you and your house i accept your suggestion that roderick and tiella get married perfect uh your wisdom and mercy allegory i've decided to accept the suggestion of a betrothal between princess jonquil and adrin oh yes i did sort out a suggest uh, a betrothal in time between princess jonquil of andalia and adron bloom who is strong he's only zero years of age at the minute but he is sir colmore bloom's son who we met in the introduction we've also met him a lot through the series that he was one of ambrose's squires i believe i'm sure he was one of ambrose's squires but he's absolutely incredible i really hope this guy doesn't die young or anything i mean look at that skilled commander unyielding a siege leader leads from the rear very very stannis like i get massive stannis vibes off this guy which is obviously going to make me love him as you know guys know i absolutely love stannis he's quick strong a formidable fighter a knight shrewd a duelist a strategist a diligent kind brave honorable content and just there's literally no bad traits there everything about him is amazing and he has a small tawny win as well i don't think his siblings are as impressive but he's very impressive he's the one who in law is currently in the north to try and suppress those revolts whilst we build our economy blessing upon you and your house i gladly accept the guardianship contract between benjen and allender ah uh, yes benjen dury and allender snow the bastard of wolf's god perfect oh and one thing i did forget to mention to the wise hamster ambrose blessing upon you i accept the suggestion that they get married awesome is that we actually have winter fever going off in the north here, which obviously with the bad winter we've got. So, as we've got a little bit of money, we're going to build a refuge in the Grey Cliffs, which will hopefully help up there. So hopefully we can try and suppress the illnesses up there and stop it spreading further south into our other lands. We really don't want that spreading too much. Oh, and we have a new law land name that I forgot. The Father's Ford down here for the fever. I absolutely loved uh, this name that was uh, suggested by, I think it was Ozza Harry, wasn't it? I'm sure it was. But yeah, uh, that's a brilliant name. Much better than the fever. The Father's Ford fits very well with the seven names that we've got going on. All the vibes of the seven. Uh, Bradmar of Wickham Peasant Revolt has declared Peasant Revolt for Wickham on King Fearmore of the Rivers and Hills. They've got a lot of Peasant Revolts going on down south. The Flint's Finger is still trying to... Oh, no. 
pause for this. This is a big event, but as I was saying, the Flint's Fingers are still trying to fight against the Starks. But Lord Danies of Maiden's Gate has died at the age of 57, a natural death. Now, he's been around for a long time. He was, if you remember right from the beginning of the series, Enger's sister, Jonquil, who was the founder of the Blue Seven Stars, he gave Maiden's Gate when we first took it to Lord Danis, and he's been around ever since as the Lord of Maiden's Gate. He's been very busy with his children, so he's got plenty of children, so the Blue... Uh, the line of the Blue Stars is very, very, very secure. Is uh, one, two, three sons, including Sir Lister Seven Star, if you, the King's Bodyguard, if you can remember, the twin. And then he's got several daughters as well, including uh, a couple of bastards. Got two bastard daughters, so I think he got a bit randy in his old age. And that is Gretchel, if you remember Lord Rogar Rax. Um, lady wife's brother lord danis is but then his oldest son has a son who has a son so the blue star line is very secure so who is our new lord of maiden's gate lord harston of maiden's gate right so you're not very impressive at all you're a little bit shy to be honest you're an expert scientist a knight scarred slothful content proud zealous and cruel so you're not very good at all you're just a cruel religious fanatic by the looks of it who's very laser and proud but you're content, at least you're not ambitious. And then your son, son, Sir Narbert, he's a little bit better. But not really too impressive. It's a shame that Lister isn't the heir. He would have been an interesting lord. Uh, Bradamore accepted King Fiamor of the Rivers. Okay, so that didn't last very long, did it? That peasant revolt. The Vale is still invading the Riverlands, so it'll be interesting to see who manages to win there. Okay, Betrothed can marry. Uh, the war against the tyranny of King Rob of the North has ended. King Rob of the North has lost. Okay, now that could be interesting. Lord Paramount Hellman of the North has used the title Castle of Walhall from Robert Stark. Okay, this is interesting. So the Flints have taken the North and he's usurping all of the titles away from the Starks. Okay, they've actually taken... He's actually taken Winterfell. Oh no, he's given Winterfell to his heir? Yes, he's given Lin... No, his brother? I think that's his brother. Or his cousin or some... He's some sort of relation to him. So what... What the hell's happened to the Starks? Okay, now this... This is... Uh, very interesting and very worrying. What the hell has happened... Here then. So let's have a look at Winterfell. Claimants. Rob Stark is imprisoned um, along with Manfred the heir to the city of Barriton. The heir? Okay, interesting. Um, so what's happened to Cregan Stark, who was the, the heir to the north? Where's he going to go? His new lich is Lord Alan the Spider. Oh, of the Flint's Finger. So they have been took into captivity by the looks of it. Now that's interesting. That's very interesting. What can we actually do about this? We could eat, we could declare war for an invasion on the north, but we're not going to do that. But what's going to happen with the Starks now? Betrothed can marry Alice Grey Star, uh, Alice Seven Star, and Sir Edmure Roseheart. That's our niece, Alice, isn't it? Yes, awesome. So that once again uh, keeps stuff nice. Ah, so we can nominate. Yeah. You should nominate successor for these titles, Kingdom of the North. Right, so they've just took it in their hand in a regency by the looks of it for now. Lord Ellery the Just, Lord of Last Half. Okay, so the Umbers are the favourites at the moment. Right, who do we vote for? We can. I love how we get a vote on this. Um... I wonder who we could nominate. Well, there's some flints. We could we could nominate ourselves, even though it's not our kingdom. I don't really want it to go away from the Stark, so we could you can even nominate the Mud King because he is half Stark. We could nominate a Bolton. There isn't actually a Stark to nominate. Well that's that's very interesting to see. What the hell is gonna happen in the north? Now, why is there a Jogus Nye on the list? What the why is there a Jogus Nye? Whatever. Right, um, well, who do we cast our vote to? Should we, should we just vote for ourselves for a laugh? Could be quite funny. But, okay, wow, interesting. Interesting to see what the hell is going to happen in the north now and what's going to happen with the, the ancient house of House Stark. 
we can upgrade holding but we're not going to do that we're just going to forward things along so that we can make some more money we really need more money and what um i am going to do as you know that we got that random courtier who showed up not long ago and we now have a name for him as well um uh, i could be mistaken but i'm sure it was seamus who thought of the name in the comments and here he is he was good brother or something rubbish like that before but now he is a baron of house swanson which fits that sigil very nicely but what i was thinking of doing is actually inviting a couple of courtiers as they're just cheap and it's easier than making custom characters and then we can make stories for these new courtiers once we invite them in so we get a master a law whispers a cell sort of scepter let's go for a young debutine and see what sort of person we get so we get Linella, who is an Andal Northman. She's a gruff diplomat, stubborn, diligent, erudite, and just. Okay, 16-year-old. Awesome. Excellent. Let's 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 just employ a couple of tours courtiers and see what we get. It would be very interesting to see if we get anything interesting. Just check we've got no factions against us. No. Lovely look at that. Crown loyalist, 233%. 18,000 men are crown loyalists. That's awesome. Oh, hand of the king. Lord Medgar of the White Star, Lord Manfred of Whitford, Lord Edric of the Father's Field, Lord Brandon of Grey Cliffs, Lord Estian, literally all our all our high lords. To all my subjects, no blood relatives of the past sovereign stand as the obvious heir to the north, leaving the succession unclear. Therefore, I have decided to use my powers as Lord Protector to crown myself and so demand fealty of the nobles of the realm as the new king. Signed, Helman of House Flint, the first of his name. That is a very bold move. The game is 100% correct about that. Now, um, where are the actual Starks? Where are the actual Starks gone? I feel like we should move them into our court. Now, listen, I know it sounds a bit weird, but... And then move them to Brandon's court, because I think Brandon would want... I know he's a bastard, but he's a nice guy, isn't he, Brandon? And I think that he would take in his half-brothers and sisters. I really do. So, here we go. We've got Cregan Stark. If we send him a gift, can we then invite him to court? I don't know if we'll be able to. We might have to force move them to our court to get them into our custody so that we can then give them to Brandon because I don't know why they're not obvious successors. And anyway, Lord Rob... Prince Rob is still alive, so he's still a prince of Winterfell, but he had a brother as well. Oh, who has died a couple of years ago but i'm sure he had a son and daughter as well oh they are craig and stark and princess sarah are his children so what happened to prince rob's children because he's got donald stark and sybil stark and winfred stark so where are you you're in lord tallheart's court in torrent square right i'm going to mark these characters up as important these starks so that we can keep an eye on them ah so one's with the glovers one is with the Flint Cliffs. One is with the Tall Hearts. Right, so they've literally been put all over the realm. Cregan is in the Flint's fingers as well. And Sarah the Princess is in King's Course. That's just below, isn't it? House Is it House Cassell, King's Course? I think it might be. Yeah, House Cassell. Yeah, but we want to keep all them important and see what happens with them. I think Rob's already important, isn't he? Yes, right. So the North is in chaos. This could be our chance to maybe expand a little bit more. But we don't actually have any claims at the minute. We do need to... Now that things are calmed down um, diplomatically, we need to send our Master of Laws to go and fabricate a claim on Moat Kaelin. Because we do need to take Moat Kaelin, because then we own everything and every way into the north. And also, as we know, House Josso, third son of the late Lord Wilbert, is the new Lord of the Crossing. So we could maybe get him to swear his fealty at some point, as he is an Andal Northman. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can get him that way and get him into our realm by doing so but anyway i think it's time for the mid pov for today's episode where we will be going once again to john white tree who obviously is the last remaining commander of the weirwood brotherhood who unbeknown to us is still trying to plot behind the seven stars back for the downfall of andalia brandon sighed as he wearily walked into his study and all but collapsed into his desk chair the construction of the city grew more and more complicated as the days wore on. For the past week, he had been rushing around the construction site, correcting one problem after the next. He thanked the gods daily for his green dreams. Without them, the city's construction would have become a disaster. He would wake each day with a different dream, which foretold the day's events. 
It was confusing at first, but then he noticed a pattern. All the problems that had arose seemed to be caused by, or were related to, his citizens that were of Vandal descent. The troubles had started with a small riot he broke up between some first men labourers and the Andal Northmen soldiers Colmer had brought up. According to John Whitetree, who had seemed suspiciously nonchalant about the whole affair, the soldiers had been antagonising his workers as they were building a house. Someone threw a rock and a fight broke out between both sides. Luckily, he was able to step in before blood was drawn. Then there was a shipment of food en route to Wolfsboro that had gone missing on its way through Lord Oxter's lands. He and John Whitetree rode out to search and discovered the carts carrying the food overturned and the men were transporting them severely injured or unconscious. John had angrily accused Lord Oxter's men of being the culprits only to shut up when Brandon had informed him that the Andal Lord and his army were on the border patrolling. Brandon dreamed of other troubles throughout the week, a robbery at the foreman's station, a building collapse and a fire breaking out in the stables. John had accused a poor Andal stable boy of committing arson. There was a knock at the door. Bringing Brandon from his thoughts, he turned and stood up at the sight of Colmore in the doorway. He wanted to see me, Lord Brandon, the young lord asked. Brandon chuckled. At least he wasn't calling him Lord Greystark anymore. Aye, lad. I'm sure you've heard about all the incidents these past few days. Colmore nodded and bowed supplicantly. Yes, I must beg your forgiveness, my lord. Ever since I've arrived, there's been nothing but trouble brewing in the Grey Cliffs. I've been trying my best to keep an eye on things, but it doesn't seem to be doing much. Brandon walked over to the boy and patted him on the shoulder reassuringly, bidding him to rise. It's not your fault, lad, nor the fault of any of your men. You're all doing a fine job. No, something is happening that is out of your control. Brandon's eyes narrowed. Someone is working to sabotage us. Who? Conmore asked, still tense over the situation. Brandon turned and walked to his desk to peer at the scattered letters and notes on it. He picked up one letter and handed it to Colmer. Tell me, what do you know about John Whitetree? Okay, so we're back from the mid-POV and I was just curious. So I've gone back to Donald Stark to see if we can maybe plot to kidnap him. And we've got 152 percent chance of being able to achieve that so we're going to do that to try and get him in our court and then we'll try and kidnap his siblings as well prince malander oh so he's a star so there's another stark as well that i actually missed i missed this guy he's only oh he's only literally just been born in his leech what the hell is he doing down in dawn Okay, that's interesting. But yeah, we're going to try and see if we can kidnap him so we can get him in our custody. We could use that to our advantage and expand our border. If the Starks have been disposed, why not try and take a bit more of this northern land? But yeah, we can hopefully try and take more of the northern land. But as we know, John Whitetree is trying to cause more problems in the realm. Let's let the game tick over. But um, another thing that has happened just while the POV was playing is that, um, oh, we'll go by vassals. It'd be the easiest way to find them. But if you remember the green stars, she has had two children. She's had two twins, Tristan Seven Star and Dinah Seven Star. So maybe the green star line of House Seven Star may survive after all, because we did think it was going to die out after the last male, Master Owen, died in that horrible tawny accident. Uh, Dear King Ambrose of Andalia, I hereby invite you to the wedding of Sir Edmure Rosar and Alice Sevenstar in White Star. Your presence would be greatly appreciated and I look forward to your attendance. I will travel to the wedding. Of course we'll attend the wedding of our niece to... I think it might be... Uh, no, I don't think it is the heir, is it, to... No, the heir's the amazing Stefan, isn't it? Okay, so Flint's are at war already. Lord Medoar greeted us warmly to the wedding. Black beer was served and the most loyal, uh, lovely, loyal, the most lovely music was played throughout the whole night. The ceremony between Sir Edmure and Alice and the Grand Feast shall be held upon the morrow. Thank you for having us. Right, who are the Flints at war with already? Your grace, since I arrived in Seven Sport, there has never been a shortage of soldiers reinforcing the troops stationed there. Thank you, Edric. Plus 50%. Let's just have a look. Who who are the Flints already at war with? Defending against Jeremy of Jeremy Stakely's host in Jeremy Stakely's host invasion of the north. Okay, so we've got another Andal invasion. Where are these Andals coming from? Because it's getting a bit annoying now that you can't switch off the Andal invasions after a certain, like, year in the bookmark. Uh, now Alice Sevenstar and Edmure Rosehart stand before the gods to take up a holy vow of marriage. The great lords and ladies of the White Star look at... Look on as he drapes the arms of House Roseheart around the bride to finally seal their marriage. And now for the feast. 
I was seated beside a person I had never really taken, uh, never really talked with before. We ended up together in the garden with a couple of bottles of brown ale from King Ambrose's well-stocked cellar. Who are we with? Septon Quincy of the Brook, Brooker's Brook. Okay, interesting. Ah, uh, okay, so he is the Septon of the Sept in the White Star. I think I've made a new friend. Okay, so we've made friends with a Septon. That's interesting not expecting that betrothed can marry now who is this going to be this is ah lord jonas of the bullseye lord edward hooton's son is getting married to mella emma wick which is her own family name because she is actually a bastard and she is a bastard of lawrence flake if you remember from the who died quite a while ago and then his son ellery was obviously murdered by the brotherhood but the Flake line lives on through her, and the Flake line is going to join with the Hooten line. So, yep, there we go. Another marriage sorted, forming more alliances throughout the kingdom, making sure that the Hooten line hopefully carries on. Okay, Lady Dalla, the spider of Little Sister, has passed away from pneumonia. Who is the new Lord of Little Sister now, then? It is Lady Alice of Little Sister. I think there's a female inheritance when it comes to the sister. I think we've discussed that before in a previous episode, if I remember right there. May you live in harmony and contentment. I accept your suggestion that Mala and Lord Jonas get married. Awesome. Speaking of uh, betrayals, I don't know if people can remember from... Was it the last episode or the episode before when we hooked up Ronessa Greystock with Samuel Rack? Now, Ronessa Greystock, she only has one trait so far, and that is Green Dreams. But Samuel Rack has dragon dreams so i'm really really hoping that we get look at and we get like a person with both of them i'm hoping for like a blood raven type character it'd be absolutely awesome if we got a blood raven character for the next generation the feast is winding down and now only the bedding remains edmure and alice are stripped of all their garments by the revelers who make many a birdie joke along the way they are then finally bundled into their bedchamber where <clears throat> where they are finally left alone a fine tradition that reminds me, I think the first night is still legalised in our realm, I've just realised. Yes, it is, it's still legal. So maybe a future king should make that illegal when it becomes an issue, like Jaehaerys did. Uh, Lord Medgar's wedding is over, and it's time to begin the long way home. Well, it's not really long, is it? It's the next province. After the music, the entertainment, and the warmth, the real world suddenly feels cold and hostile. Will there be another wedding? Gain at 10 prestige. Well, yeah, there's weddings happening constantly at the moment, actually. Here we go. Here's another one. Betrothed can marry. Literally all the weddings are happening at the moment. And it's between Lord Theon Bolton of the Strangers Hills and our daughter, Princess Alice. Now, this is one of the most important weddings in our kingdom at the moment. We're really hoping that that can help forge Andal and First Man together peacefully and help spread that peace up north and keep the peace your wisdom and mercy are legendary i accept your suggestion that princess alice and lord theon get married he'll hopefully be of age soon so we get to see his adult picture as well which will be cool and there we go it's just popped up now here lord theon of the strangers hills quick attractive a skilled fighter shy paranoid and deceitful 15 years of age our, our second daughter hasn't yet got our adult picture but he looks pretty cool doesn't look very bolton does it doesn't look very bolton at all Let's see if we can invite another courtier now that we can make a story. A daughter was born to Rahani of Mir and Master Gerald of Sevensport named Dora. Oh, okay. Rahani of Mir, Dora Snow. Okay, so your parents are... And at the age of zero, your subject, Belena Salzard, has died stillborn. Oh, no. But, okay, so your daughter, Dora Snow... And, okay, she worships R'hllor, apparently. Which is strange. Is that what the mother... Ah, the mother worships R'hllor. The dad... Ah, but you're not the dad. So, did it say Gerald Mendelton was the dad? I could have sworn it said Gerald Mendelton was the dad. Maybe it's a bit of a secret at the moment. So, he's fathered a bastard, finally. And, oh, no. At the age of zero, your subject, Dennett Brightmire, died stillborn. Ah, that is not what the Brightmires need, is it? Look at that for bad luck. Son, dead. Daughter. Well, murdered, murdered. His other daughter's still alive, the heir to High Point, and now Dennett Brightmere has been born, stillborn, so things just get worse and worse for Robin. How he does not have the depressed and stressed trait, I'll never know. He's a stronger man than I am. Prince Dyke, the milk drinker, accepted King Fearmore of the River and Hills, peace offer. 
Okay, that mean, does that mean they've expanded their lands a little bit? Maybe. Theomor Ward has transferred the vassalage contract of Gunther Fortune to someone else. Okay, doesn't really concern us in the north that much, does it? Oh yeah, I was trying to employ a new courtier. Let's go for... We've got enough septons. Let's go for a Master of Law. Someone diplomatic. Let's have a look. Morse. Well, okay, he's not bad actually. He's pretty good. Decently intrigued, learning, uh, martial, and he's a pretty all-round character. Awesome. So we'll make him important. And we'll try and make a story for this guy. Let's say so. Excellent. Let's, um, oh. Uh, and he died of poor health instantly. <laughs> well, that was good, wasn't it? What a waste of money that was. We'll probably hold a tawny soon. I'm surprised that I've not had to pay a dowry to Lord Bolton, considering he's just married our um, daughter. And Rosamund Seven Star needs a childhood focus. Wow. That's a very good stewardship for a six-year-old. She has a stutter, so her diplomacy's down, but we're going to have to definitely go with Thrift for you, aren't we? Try and improve your... Uh... Oh, no, you're our niece, aren't you? Who is, yes, betrothed to Lord Silver Eye. That's right, I remember now. How are the Silver Eyes getting on across the Narrow Sea, actually, in the coastlands? Lord Kristen II of the coastlands. Let's offer him a non-aggression pact. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, we'll offer him... Wow, he's got a lot of children. We'll offer him an non-aggression pact. Try and get trade with those like we suggested in the introduction. <clears throat> Your Grace, I'm pleased to report that the majority of the population in Wolf's Watch has been converted to the Faith of the Seven. Okay. Well, that's probably going to cause some problems now. The recent conversion of Wolf's Watch to Faith of the Seven has caused great unrest. I, we, we do have... Where's Wolf's Watch? We do have an Andal Overlord. So that was probably going to happen anyway, wasn't it? But... Yeah, Faith of the Seven is now spreading up into the old godlands where yeah, that could cause problems. Oh no, and at the age of 35, Max Richards has died of poor health. He's still pregnant, apparently, as some of you noticed in the last episode. I've got no idea how that happened, but poor old Max Richards has died. Probably for the best. I think I'd rather be dead after what happened to him. I think I'd choose death over castration, to be honest, as I'm sure many men would. My bodyguard, Sir Lister, has expressed a desire to get married and has asked for my permission to find a suitable spouse. Okay, Sir Lister, I didn't think you'd ever get married, to be honest. You got a bastard. But, um, yeah, okay, we'll arrange a marriage for you. Let's have a look. Um, I'll find him somebody nice. Right, who's got a... Your theatre. Who's got a daughter that could marry you. What about the Boltons? Are your sisters both married? Yes, they are. And they're all quite young. Got quite a few Boltons about the Burberry Bolton is eight. Can we arrange a betrayal with her? Have we got anyone we could marry down? Not Enger. Um Joe Iraq. Well, they do border each other. Could we get peace between the Boltons and the Racks by doing that as they do border each other? I think that'd be a good match. <laughs> yeah, why not? We'll go for it. Let's try and really bring the Boltons into the realm. And if they play up, it gives the Rax a chance to maybe expand into those lands if um, anything goes wrong there. But we was looking for a match for um, Sir Lister, wasn't we? Right, somebody's got to have a daughter. Redguard, no. What about the oldest Redguard? Has he got a daughter? Right, let's... Somebody in our realm. Let's have a look. Find characters just in our realm. Uh, gender, woman. Culture. Yep, yeah, my culture. We want an Andal uh, North woman if we can. And married, no. Right, let's have a look for one with good stats. What is with these and the pictures missing all of a sudden? I'm getting a lot of that. The game is starting to... I don't know if it's because we've got quite far into this playthrough, but we're getting a hell of a lot of that at the minute. Okay, Esma Sande. She don't look too bad. Intrigue. She's up there again. Let's go for her. Let's arrange a, arrange a marriage between you and Sir Lister Seven Star of the Blue Seven Stars. There we go. And now let's forward things along as we've not really done at much time at the minute. Your wisdom and mercy are legendary. I, Lord Kristen the Second of the Coastlands, accept your proposal for a non-aggression pact. King Ambrose of Andalia fulfilled the ambition to see the realm prosper. Ah, yes, because we've been at peace for five years, and that's awesome. Peace with you. I've decided to accept your suggestion of a betrothal. Awesome. Your grace, for some time now, I've been in the employ of Lord Medgar, but now I seek a better station. I humbly request to join you in Sevensport. Let's have a look at you, Sir Bernard. 
Defender, Siege Leader, Inspiring Leader, Train Fighter. Um, how much would it cost? 40 gold gain. Mm. No, we've got enough courtiers, haven't we? We don't really need to be bringing him into the court, if I'm perfectly honest. I think we've got enough as it is. And I've completely forgot what I was about to do because of that popping up. I don't remember what I was doing. That was it. We need a new ambition, don't we? So... Become exiled, exalted amongst men. Prestige is greater or equal to 4,000. Yeah, we'll go for that one up. I don't think we're going to get it. These are dark days. My daughter, Princess Violet, has been beset by high fever for... Oh, no. High fever for several days. And I have just been informed that her affliction is indeed winter fever. Called for a physician at once. We do not want our daughter to die. Recently, I've noticed a pitiful state of my daughter, Princess Jonquil. And I've just been informed that the cause of her aches and fatigue is a case of the flu. Called for a physician. Okay, so we've got a lot of illnesses now going on. And Sander Brightmere died stillborn. Who are your parents? Oh, so you're the son of the sister Brightmere. My God. Jorman, you have really bad luck with the uh, your custom characters. It's ridiculous. You must have the worst look. Right, let's have a look. Is Winter Fever... No, it's still not spread past Greyhold. But I'm now very worried that our daughter may die. We definitely don't want that. Where is she? Violet, there she is. I have a long and strong... <clears throat> I have a long and strong sense of right and wrong. Always doing the moral thing, even if it's caused me loss. I now know that this sense on this sense honour only makes me naive and weak. I will be pragmatic from now on. Loses the trait honourable. Okay, that's interesting. Why is it whenever you get awesome characters like this, they always get ill and probably die? Please don't die, Princess Violet. Please do not die. You're one of our links to try and bring the First Men and the Andals together. I wonder how our claim's going down south, the claim that we were uh, currently fabricating. King Ambrose Seven Star, I hereby invite you to participate in the tourney of Seven's Guard. Um, yeah, why not? We want to get more prestige, don't we, to try and become... Better. Under my guidance, my young ward, Davos, is slowly mastering the art of swordmanship. He's become a poor fighter. So he's probably not going to be as successful as our last uh, wards, but hopefully he'll still become pretty successful. Right, so we've got a tawny on the way. We want to have a tawny ourselves when we get champ. How is our plot going? That's what I wanted to check. My plot's... Oh, I forgot to auto invite people. That would probably help. Surely there'll be loads of people willing to join our plot, surely. I'd imagine so. Let's try and sway some of these guys. Send you a little gift. Got a little bit of money to try and make this happen. Send a gift, yes. Send a gift, yes. So hopefully some of these guys will now... Um join our plot send a gift yeah there we go people are starting to join now so we can hopefully get that plot underway and kidnap the star care and make use of him i'm pleased to hear that after a period of peace and shrewd management the province of seven spot is doing very well people are happy and the tax collectors are reporting record intakes everything is absolutely flying up and our disease resistance is down as well uh, Hunter needs proper training if he is to perform well during hunts. Perhaps you should take a hand in it yourself. Yes, I will train him personally. Whilst preparing for the tourney, a young peasant boy has taken to helping you with your horse and armour. You're not quite sure where he came from and how he came to start helping you, but he seems an earnest lad and eager to help. Perhaps he would make a good squire. Cregan. He's diligent, ambitious, honourable and a poor fighter. He's an Andal Northman. Um, yeah, I'll take him on. Awesome. He looks pretty interesting. Let's make him important. Maybe we can raise him to nobility after we knight him at some point. We'll go for... Mm, you're very good in diplomacy and martial. We'll go for martial probably too... Mm, you're very good all round though. Could go for a diplomacy education and get diplomacy and... Mm, then again, you're... A, no, we'll go for martial. We'll just go for the martial. After arriving in Seven's Guard, the first day of the tourney began in earnest. You tilted against many lesser knights throughout the day, most of whom you won horse easily. Now in the coming days, the final list uh, round time blah, 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 blah. The final round of lists begins, and the opposition shall surely be more fierce. I shall ready my horse. The tourney herald announces the competitors, the next joust. You have been drawn against Sir Berinda and Rosby, that's our uncle, isn't it? Still need to land him. You mount your charge and take a lance from your squire and ride to the end of the list, and Sir Berinda does likewise. Then on cue the horses break into a gallop. As you close in on your opponent, you see an opening. You definitely guard your lance and just strike while evading their charge. Hit. 
Sir Brynden took the full force of your lance and was sent reeling and only managed a glancing blow upon your own armour. He almost fell off but managed to regain his balance and round the other end of his list ready for another tilt. I'll knock him off this time. Oh no, at the age of 18, your subject Edmure unfortunately died in a tawny joust accident. Everyone was enjoying the fine display of jousting when Sir Edmure Roseheart and Sir Lucas Longfort were paired up in the last tilt. Sir Edmure did not fare well as Sir Lu Lucas's lance found a gap in the armour gruesomely impaling him. With him in the dirt in a pool of blood it was clear he would die. How unfortunate now. Who was you married to? Alice Seven saw our niece. You've literally only just married our niece and she's in hiding for some reason. Is she pregnant? Yeah, she's pregnant, so she's going to give you an heir, but that's that's it, unfortunately. Poor Alice. And she's in her final month, so yeah, that's why she's in hiding. So that, damn it. As you close in on your opponent, you see an opening. You definitely guard your lance into strike whilst evading their charge. Hit. It's crazy that a rose heart of all people's died in a tourner, the tawny experts. You expertly struck Sir Brindon with your lance right in the middle of his breastplate, causing your lance to shatter into a thousand pieces. As he is sent flying from the saddle, the crowd gives a great cheer at your victory and is relieved to see Sir Brindon is unharmed. You have been declared the winner, defeating Sir Brindon. No one can beat. The tourney Harrod announces the competitor of the next chat. You have been drawn against Dezil and Sai. You mount your charge and take a lance. Surely we can beat a ruinish person in a joust. It's not even their... Um, expertise is it as you're closing on your opponent you see an opening you definitely guard your lance in a strike while evading their charge oh damn someone else has died everyone was enjoying the fine display of jousting when sir john roseheart and sir colmore bloom were paired up in the last till sir john did not fare well as sir colmore's lance found a gap in the oak armor gruesomely impaling him with him in the dirt in a pool of blood it was clear he would die two rosehearts have died in a tourner that is absolutely devastating his wife is Rosamond Longthorpe. But he does have a daughter though. So, damn it, we've just lost two male Rosehearts. That's not good. I'll knock him off next time. As you close on your opponent, you definitely guide your lance in strike. Alice Seven Star is back at our court. Can't believe two Rosehearts have died in a tourner. Uh, you expertly struck Dezel with your lance right in the middle of his breastplate, causing your lance to shatter into a thousand pieces. He is sent flying from the saddle. The crowd gives a great cheer at your victory and is relieved to see Dezel is unharmed. A fine hit. You have been declared the winner. Does that mean we're going to get Colmore Bloom? It's Lord Halman Bloom and Sir Lucas Longfort with an extra joust. Lord Halman is declared the winner. The Tawny Herald announces a competitor of the next joust. You have been drawn against Colmore Bloom. We've got no chance. We're not winning this. Um, you mount your charge and take a lance from your squire and ride to the end of the list as Sir Colmore does likewise. Then on cue, the horse breaks into a gallop. Your opponent got the better of you and you met in the centre of the list. Your lance he merely makes a glancing blow on their armour while their lance hits true. Oh dear. Queen Rowena the Scared accepted King Fiamir of the Rivers and Hills peace offer. Okay, so the Muds have managed to force back the Arons. <clears throat> Sir Colmore Bloom lamp strikes you square in the middle of your breastplate, blown into a thousand pieces. Ouch, so we're in the dirt. I only reached the semi-finals of the tournament, having been knocked on my horse by a superior jouster. Though my glory is less in this day, I can still claim a purse for reaching the final rounds. My squire deserves some credit, so we'll give it to young Cregan. Sir Colmore Bloom has been declared the winner, defeating you. There is always next time. Uh, so that means we're going to have Colmore and his father jousting in the final. And Lord Halman was unhorsed, leaving Sir Colmore Bloom to be declared the winner. So son defeats father in the final. But the most tragic thing is that two Rose Hearts lost their life in that tournament. And now we've got an invasion of the Rivers and Hills from another Andal host. And now we've got a open council position. What council position has opened up? A new advisor. Okay, so we need a new advisor. We will go with... Let's go with Sir Davos Redguard for our new advisor. How many... Rose hearts are left male, so we've got Lord Medgar, and then his son Sir Edmure died, but Sir Stephen Roseheart is still alive, and then he has his sibling John Roseheart, who does have Cosgrove uh, Roseheart, so there's still a few Rosehearts left around. Has Stephen had a son yet? No, he's had a daughter and is stillborn, so hopefully the Rosehearts will be alright, but Stephen's impressive. But anyway, we will end this episode here now, guys, with the end of that tourney. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to hang around for the end POV if you enjoy the POVs. And don't forget to like and subscribe, please, guys. It really does mean the world to me if you could do that. And I would greatly, pardon me, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed and hopefully I'll see you all next time. 
They came for him in the night. Men dressed in black captured and bound his mouth and eyes with cloth and carried him somewhere outside. He could feel the chill of the night air biting at his neck. Eventually he was dropped to the ground. Before he could move the men grabbed his arms and bound them behind his back. He heard whispering and shortly thereafter he heard the sound of the men leaving their feet crunching in the snow. Before long he was met with silence and it was then that the blindfolding gag came off of him. He was ready to enter a shouting match with whoever dared to kidnap him, but the words died in his throat when he looked up to see his captor, Brandon Greystark. Aghast, John spoke first. Uh, Lord, Lord Greystark, I, I don't understand. Why have me tied up in the dead of night? It must be the hour of the wolf. Brandon simply stared at him, seemingly unsure of what to say. The Lord then closed his eyes and turned away from him. I must say I'm impressed, John. Impressed with what, my lord? I'm impressed with your faith. My faith? John asked. There are a good many of us in Andalia that still keep to the old gods. However, your devotion to them is unquestionably more stronger than mine. John smiled at his lord. This must be a test of some kind, he thought. Yes, that's it. I'm finally going to be allowed into his inner circle. Then I can reveal my true plans to him. I... I'm honoured to hear you say that, my lord, John said. I... Now don't get ahead of yourself, John, Brandon interrupted. While it is a blessing to see you have such a deep love for our gods, it's also blinded you to the bigger picture. I, I don't understand, my lord, John replied. It is understandable that something like the Brotherhood of the Weirwood would eventually rise up in the wake of Andalia's expansion further north. However, your intent to defend our faith has only put it more at risk, Brandon said as he walked up and crouched down to meet the other man's eyes. You're doing more harm than good, John, and I want you to see that. You are their beating heart, you can control where the Brotherhood can go from here. We need the Andals to see that those of us who follow the old gods aren't savage murderers. John reeled back, falling into the trodden snow. How did you... No, Brandon asked. How did I know? It was quite obvious when you looked carefully. Every incident that has occurred in the Grey Cliffs since you arrived all supposedly start with an Andal Northman or otherwise, antagonising the resident first men. It also helped that you had some involvement in each case. Either you were near or at the scene, or you aided me in solving the issue. John spluttered, anger bubbling up inside him. This is all circumstantial. You don't have any proof. I won't lie down and let Ambrose's pet Northman throw these wild accusations at me. Brandon chuckled and pulled John onto his feet. Well, aside from your reaction being telling enough, I do have some evidence. I saw everything. Each night I would see every incident play out and it gave me enough information to stop any trouble from brewing. Granted, what I saw was very vague, but I've gotten better at interpreting them. John's anger quickly was doused by a wave of both confusion and awe. His eyes were as big as saucers. No, he said, that's not possible. There hasn't been one in centuries, let alone someone with Stark blood. Brandon grinned at him. Aye, it's hard to believe. I had trouble believing in it myself. But time and time again, the green dreams came. John's brow furrowed. I don't understand. Why help the Seven Stars? They slaughtered us and burnt our weirwoods. My lord, by all means, you should be the head of the Brotherhood. Brandon shook his head. That was Engor's doing. The man was a fanatic. I would have nightmares about him when I was a wee green boy. Ambrose is different, though. Even if he follows his seven gods, he still holds a love for our faith. What makes him so different? John asked snidely. Because he understands that religion does not make the man. It also helps that I saved his life when we were small. You saved his life? Brandon nodded. I had just arrived in Andalia after escaping some ironborn raiders. He was hunting with Rack and I was watching them from some underbush. I was going to let them pass by when I got a vision a stag was going to charge at Ambrose and kill him if I didn't do something. The gods bid you to save him? John interjected, surprised. Aye. Had it not been for them, Andalia's ruler wouldn't have been Ambrose. Does Ambrose know? John asked. Of course, he's my closest and oldest friend. Chosen by the gods, John whispered. This Ambrose, if the old gods wished him to live, then perhaps it was good this Andor was king. He fell silent, processing the information he had been giving. Seeing his demeanour change, Brandon walked behind him and undid the binds that held his arms together. Before long, John spoke again. If you knew, why didn't I kill you and be done with it? Brandon said, completing his thought. John nodded. Well, for starters, if I killed you and word got out you were the mastermind of the rebellion, you probably would have become a martyr. More importantly, though, I think someone with your character can do some good for our people. You think so? I know so. We need a strong voice. We need to let the Andals and their Septons know we are just as worthy of living in this nation as they are, and that getting along is the best way to lead to our mutual prosperity. Why me of all people, John asked. I practically tore apart the realm. It has to be you, because it shows that we can heal. It shows that we can be better hosts to our Andal brothers. John looked down at his feet. 
How could he be sure if Brandon was speaking the truth? This all could be an elaborate bluff, but then again, given his relationship with the King, it would have made sense for Brandon to convert to the Faith of the Seven, and yet Brandon consistently remained devout to the Old Gods. He even married his heir and the Seven Star Gale below a Weirwood. From his sources, he also knew that Brandon had often butted head with Edric Firehand over the conversion of the Norman lands to the Faith of the Seven. Brandon's dedication to the Old Gods were what drew him here in the first place. He thought if he could use Brandon's faith to sway him to the Brotherhood's side, they would gain a powerful ally. If anything, Lord Greystock was as much a champion of the Old Gods as he was. Finally, he spoke. I'll do it. I'll help guide our people. Brandon rested an arm on his and smiled, then let us begin.